Good morning. Harmony, how we doing? Good. Oh, yeah? You sure? <laughs> Let's try that again. Good morning, Harmony. How we doing? Yeah. Ooh, you should be joyful. It's Sunday, right? Right, 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 right. Well, today our journey through the book of Philippians comes to an end. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> it's like saying goodbye to an old friend at this point, right? We've been hearing about Paul and Tim and Big E. Um, but now we're going to say goodbye to him. We're going to be wrapping up with chapter 4, verses 10 through 23. And as Paul brings his letter to a close, he moves in a direction to tackle one last subject. So let's read in verses 10 through 13, where he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every, or any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul's joy was heard throughout the prison cell when Epaphroditus arrived with this Philippians gift. He knew the church really cared, and they were showing their love as they gave from their poverty. They themselves were experiencing hard times, and so this gift was all the more precious to Paul. And he wrote that they had revived their love for him. The apostle is very, very grateful for this gift. And he doesn't want to make them feel bad for not be giving before, but because he reassures them that he is well aware of this love. This love that they have for him, this love that they have for his ministry, this love and respect that they have for what Paul is doing outside of this prison cell and even while he's there. However, he takes the opportunity to teach about what it really means to be content. Now, as I prepared this sermon, I thought about what contentment looked like in my life. Whew. But what does it mean for you in your life? You see, contentment can be something that's difficult to find. We go after what we think will make us happy, only to find that it really doesn't. In fact, we were happier before we started that journey or quest to find what contentment really means. We aren't content to live within our means, so we go into debt to live just a little bit better than we can afford. But while we suffer anxiety from this pressure of paying our bills and things that we should put in place of some of these things. See, I have this... <clears throat> addiction is such a hard word, but I have this uh, ability to buy guitars. <laughs> it's where I find my contentment. So even as my mom was in town this weekend, yesterday we were sitting around doing nothing. I said, hey, we should go to Guitar Center. And mom said, no, we don't. <laughs> and I was like, thanks, mom. <laughs> thanks, mom. <laughs> thanks, mom. Appreciate that, mom. Looking out for me. Your utility bill paid? <laughs> All right, mom. But you think about it. In, in, this, in these verses, if we look through 10 through 13, we see a man who sits in prison because of these corrupt officials awaiting possible execution over these false charges, and, that, and he's telling us how to find contentment. You have someone that don't know what might not happen next, and yet he is telling us here that he has learned to be content whatever the circumstances. The answer lies buried in the midst of this thank you note, if we will, as we talked about earlier in Philippians, this letter of joy. But the Philippian church had sent this financial gift to Paul, the prisoner, their friend, someone they trusted, someone that they appreciated. And he wants to express his heartfelt thanks, but at the same time, he doesn't want to give the impression that the, impression that the Lord was not sufficient for his every need. Even though he had been in a difficult situation, he doesn't want his people to think that he had been discontented before the gift arrived. This gift that might make everything better in his situation. But he does want them to know that their generosity was truly appreciated. So he combines his thanks with this valuable lesson on the secret 
for contentment. See, the word content, as we see in verse 11, he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. This comes from a Greek word that means self-sufficient or independent. Now, don't ask me to try to pronounce that word. (laughs) As Christians, we can work to better our circumstances as we have the opportunity. Because we do. We have the opportunity to find contentment in those things that really, truly matter to us. Not in some beautiful guitar hanging on the wall at Guitar Center. Calling my name. So see, now I'm going to hear mom saying, no, you don't. (laughs) But the Bible praises this hard work and the rewards that come from this work that we do as long as we are freed from why we're doing it. This greed, if you will. So what does contentment mean to you? What does contentment mean in your circumstance? What's, what does, how do you apply that to your life? It's an inner sense of rest or peace that comes from being right with God and knowing that He is in control to all, all that happens to us. It means having our focus on the kingdom of God and serving Him, not for the love of money and that beautiful guitar hanging on the wall. (sighs) Yeah. But if God grants us material comforts, we can thankfully enjoy those, knowing that it all comes from His loving hand. Also, we seek to use it for His purpose, for being so generous to us. If He takes our riches, our joy remains steady because we are fixed on His plans and purposes for what where we find that contentment. So Paul mentions that the Philippians had renewed their concern for him. And he's quick to add that they always had been concerned, but they lacked opportunity. See, we don't know what had prohibited their sending this gift to Paul while he was in prison, and I'm sure that he was probably thinking, why hasn't this come sooner? Here I am struggling. Here I am chained to this huge Roman guard. And yet, he's saying he's content. Whether it was a lack of funds, maybe that was their funds. Maybe they were expecting him to come home at any moment. We don't know. A reliable messenger to take the gift, not knowing about Paul's circumstances. Or maybe it was some other reason. But whatever the reason, Paul knew that God was in control. God knew his need. And God would supply or not supply as he saw fit. Sometimes God supplied abundantly, and so Paul had learned how to live in prosperity, and he finds that contentment through whatever circumstance. He tells us over and over. And most of us, most of us including myself, would like to learn from that lesson. But sometimes God withheld support, and so Paul had to learn to get along with those humble means of finding contentment with that chain, finding contentment in that dark room, finding contentment in that dusty room, whatever situation he found himself in. And at those times, we see here in the scripture that he didn't grumble or panic, but he submitted to that sovereign hand of God, trusting that God knew what was best for him, and that he always cared for his children. It's tough. Sometimes we face the circumstances that we're going through in our lives. I can speak for this. It's hard to say, okay, God, you're in control. Okay, God, you got this. Instead, we're so quick to say, why? Why is this happening to me? But notice Paul learned to be content in those conditions. He learned to be content in those situations. It didn't come naturally to him, and it wasn't just this instant transformation, which that would be kind of neat, right? But it was a process, something that we learn from walking with God each day. We find contentment daily. It doesn't say Oh, if you trust me, you might find it one day. We're playing hide and seek. When you find contentment, you win. No, he's saying that these times we don't grumble or panic, but we have to submit to him, trusting that God knew what was best for him and that he always cared for his children. In whatever condition. He says Paul learned to be content in all those conditions, whether good or bad. I want to focus on Philippians 4.13 for a minute. and That's something we've all heard growing up. I can remember hearing this almost every church retreat I've been on or church outing. I remember 
being a small kid, going to church camp. And that was one that we always, Philippians 4.13. But he says this, if we look at 4.13, he says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. He doesn't say you're going to go through this so that you'll recognize your weakness. He doesn't say that you're going to go through this so that hopefully at this point it's going to bring you to your knees. He says, no, he says that you are able to get through what you're going through because it is him who gives you the strength. By all things. Paul means that he can do everything that God has called him to do in his service for his kingdom. He can obey God. He can live in holiness, in thought, in word, in deed. He can ask for these provisions to, to be needed to be carry out the work and expect God to answer. But if God has called you to get up in public and speak, he's going to give you the power to do it. If he's called you to serve behind the scenes, he's going to equip you with the endurance you need to do just that. If he's called you to, go, to serve on a team, he's going to equip you to do just that. And surely many of us can think of a time or share a time when that verse has been an encouragement or a help. Or another time where we've used it to urge somebody on. Come on, you can do it. He tells you you can do all these things through him. I can remember being a time, um, being a youth director and a, and a helper, we would always take our youth to a, a place in uh, Maryville, Tennessee, which is called Eagle Rock. And I remember one of the first times I heard it, and when I kind of had that, I guess that spiritual epiphany, if you will. I remember there was a part on the weekend where we would go to this like 50,000 rock, 50, foot rock wall, and you know, you stand there and go, oh, I'm about to climb that? <laughs> And I remember being that one counselor, there was one kid that like, he was like, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And he got about halfway through and I was like, Adam, don't let go. You have a rope, you're not going to fall. Just, and I remember at that point, I can remember being that, being that guy and shouting that verse to a youth too nervous saying, you can do it. The Bible says you can. And I'm going, what am I, what, what does that mean? <laughs> like, you can do it. The Bible says you can. But later on, I kind of reflected on that. I was like, man, what, is, what does that verse really mean? That we can push ourselves to these physical feats or these worldly accomplishments? Did that really help Adam to go over that 50,000 foot drop off and say, Adam, you can do it. And he's going to go, yes, I can. But I can see way down to the bottom. <laughs> can it really mean that? Then how do people who don't know Christ navigate these rock walls? If they don't know Christ and I tell them, you can do all this through Christ who strengthens you. They're gonna, are they going to listen to me? Did I really need Jesus in order to convince Adam that he was going to be okay and not hear the word splat before the end of the day? If the meaning here is as the commentary suggests, he says, I have strength for all things. Then consider whether all things involves that stuff that we'd normally try to avoid. Think about it. The problems that you're facing in your life. When you can't pay those bills. If you've gone through a bad breakup in a relationship or whatever the scenario may be. And it's scary. It's scary. New beginnings, new chapters, new journeys. All that's scary because we ask ourselves, what do I do now? What's going to happen to me? But all these things, whether all this involves stuff that we normally try to avoid, those problems, suffering, trials, tribulations, and all manner of troubles that cause you to need that strength, could that be where God wants you for his greatest glory to show his perfect strength? I think that's where God wants us to when we finally look up. And I might be that guy holding on to that rope and go, okay, God, can I do this? And he's saying, yes, you can. I'm giving you the strength to do this. You can beat this. You can do this. And I think so often we isolate this verse and we apply it to only encourage us to do the impossible, which I'm all for. However, I think sometimes we need to remember that Christ is also there to help in our day-to-day, -day, in our hour-to-hour, -hour, in our minute-to-minute. -minute. And Paul says he can remain content no matter what the circumstance, no matter what it is around him. I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but think about it. Paul wrote these words while he was locked away in prison. And even while captured, he wrote about rejoicing and being full of joy I heard a preacher once say, you're either in a storm, you just got out of one, or you're about to enter one. And that can sound intimidating at first, but realistically, we all know change and difficulty are a part of daily life. But we can, be, we can breathe easier and rest with a little bit more confidence because 
We can't handle that on our own. I've tried. You can't. You need that encouragement. Jesus gives us just that. He gives us that strength. And he's with us before, after, and during those bad parts of our life. Let's move on to verses 14 through 20. And he says, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. And not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. He says, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And he says to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, what we find here is that Paul is beginning to wrap up this letter to the Philippians. And he is so glad that the gospel has taken root in their life. And it's transforming many of them. And the church there is not ashamed to be associated with Paul. He gives us a rare picture of what happened after he had to leave Philippi in Acts 16. And he travels on to Thessalonica. Yes? Okay, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. (laughs) To start another church. To plant something different. To start over. To meet those people. And this small church had only been in existence for a month, maybe two, and they were already taking up a collection to make sure that the gospel is able to go to the rest of Paul's journey, wherever it may have found him. They didn't sit back and wait until they heard of that need. They wanted to do it. They wanted to supply. They were excited. They found contentment on what Paul had planted there and said, I want this for someone else. Those people that are weak and they might be on that rock and saying, I can't do this. And they're telling them, hey, look, you can do this. Paul, uh, Jesus, uh, he gave us that, that strength and that we need. They were proactive in learning about where Paul was going next. And they wanted to meet him there. They wanted to follow him. They wanted to say, we're excited about what you're doing. We want somebody else to find contentment like us. The church needed to stay and reach those people. So you think about that. If we find strength, and we know that someone else has given their time and found encouragement with somebody else, what is that saying about the condition of our heart? What does our encouragement say about where our true loyalty lies? The Bible teaches that we are worshipers and we are only able to worship one thing at a time. We have this single treasure. It's either Christ. Or where you find that contentment? I want to ask you something. The question of this is, and I found this. I I read a survey, and you guys know I'm in school, and so I'm doing biblical studies. And so one of the first things we had to do was, like, take this survey. And one of the big papers I had to write was how applying my Christian religion and my beliefs and my faith is important at a Christian school rather than going to a secular school and finding that education. Because we're able to be distracted by many things around us. But one of the things is, the question was, is which one of the items below do you worship? It was A, self. B, material goods, including money. C, Jesus Christ. D, your family. And then the second question was, which one of these items that was just listed do you think the most about? Or what do you think about the most? Same thing, self, material goods, including money, Jesus, your family. How would that test go for you? We all say we worship, but what do our actions and thoughts reveal about that reality? Are we finding contentment in Christ? Or are we blaming Him for the things that we're going through? What do we do with those resources that God gives us is a window into our soul. Our practices concerning what we do with what God gives us really shows the reality of your heart. Let's go on to verses 21 through 23, where he says, Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. 
All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. See, what I want to point out here is that his letter ends as does all his letters with this fond farewell. For Paul, it wasn't only about theology, but it was about real people being changed by a real Savior. Sinners made saints by the grace of Jesus Christ. To greet means to spend time in warm exchange. And Paul commanded the Philippian Christians to greet all the believers for him. One Bible dictionary actually defined fellowship as the essence of the Christian life. Fellowship with God and fellowship with other believers in Christ. Another Bible dictionary puts it this way. Communion with God, which results in common participation with other believers in the Spirit of God and God's blessings. Now to me, I found it interesting that the Christians in Caesar's household get this special mention. Verse 22 clearly indicates that Christianity had already penetrated into the very center of the Roman government, which if you know scripture, that's a big deal. These Christians in Caesar's household were probably slaves, freedmen, and freed women in the emperor's service, those who were responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the empire rather than blood relatives. And regardless, his passing comment here shows just how widespread the gospel message can be. Spreading from his prison cell to members of the household of the most powerful man in the world at the time. See, Paul's message and the things he said didn't go unheard. Now the point is, is that even though we sometimes have our differences, where we find contentment, we need each other. We are to bear one another's burdens. We are to stand with those who are hurting to listen, to love, and give support. And so I will ask you to commit yourselves to joyfully striving side by side for the faith. This is a wonderful church full of so many wonderful people. But we are just people. None of us are perfect. And from time to time, we're going to say or do things that we may not be proud of. And we're going to do those things. But I'm excited about what is God, God is going to do in this church. And I'm confident that God is going to continue to do work here as long as we are faithful to him and to each other and that we joyfully stride side by side for the faith. Remember, closing, Philippians tells us how to know God's joy in every circumstance. We will know joy by knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel so that we grow in fellowship with him we will know joy by getting our focus off ourselves and onto those others so that we fellowship in God's grace with other believers. And we'll know joy by bearing witness of his glorious gospel to those who are lost so that they can enter the same joy of fellowship with God and with his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. And we thank you for um, Paul and what he did and what his ministry meant to those people then and what it even means to his people now. Father, I pray that we find that strength and that we lean on that verse the, the, where he says we can do all these things in whatever circumstances and trials that we face right now. Father, let us cling to that to know that we can do all those things and find that strength in you because you give it to us, because you love us so much. Be with us as we leave this place and when life comes at us hard. Father, we seek to you for that guidance and wisdom. It's in your name I pray. Amen.